This morning, before we actually go into our message, I'd like to invite you to just bow your heads for a moment with me. Our loving Father in heaven, again, we come before your throne this morning. And the, the question, Lord, is that each one of us needs to be looking to you. We realize that we all have gone through various struggles through the course of our week, some much greater than others. But the question remains, will our faith be strong in you when trials come? So we ask that again this morning as we spend this time together that you would pour out your spirit upon each heart in this room. May we be able to put aside the busyness, the cares of life for just a few minutes and look upon the beauty and the glory and the majesty of your power and what you long to do for each one of us. So bless us to this end, we pray, and thank you for what you will do in this place this morning, because we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. If I were to say to you this morning, God is good, you would say, and if I said all the time, you would say, God is good. But you know, our topic this morning is life is hard, but God is good. Do you believe that? In order for us to really understand this statement and to make it part of us, we need to actually have faith in what God can and will do in our lives. So really, this message this morning is going to be about faith. How is your faith today? I hope your faith is strong. And I'd like to begin by going to the book of Hebrews to the chapter of faith, Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to look at the very first verse of Hebrews chapter 11, the verse that's the biblical definition of what faith really is. Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to look at verse 1. I love to hear those pages, and I'll wait until it sounds like they've almost come to a stop or are to a stop. But we want to be able to all read along together as you look at this verse. This is a very powerful and important verse in the Christian experience. Hebrews 11 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Look, think for just a moment about a couple of those words, substance. Substance is that of which a thing consists. And in the book Faith and Works, page 25, it says, Faith is rendering to God the intellectual powers, abandonment of the mind and will to God, and making Christ the only door to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So how is your faith this morning? The next word that's important in that statement is hope. Faith is the substance of our hope. Well, what is your hope in this morning? The dictionary tells us that hope is to look forward to with desire and reasonable confidence, to believe, desire, or trust, or to feel that something desired may happen. Thus, we sing the song, we have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ alone imparts, faith in the promise of his word. As we consider hope this morning, let's go and look at a few verses in God's word. Go with me to Psalms chapter 78. We're just going to look briefly, a mini study on the word hope. Psalms chapter 78 and we're going to look at verse 7, Psalms chapter 78 and verse 7. Just look at a few verses as we move into this topic this morning. Life is hard, but God is good. Psalms 78 and verse 7, the Bible says that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Is your hope in God this morning? Are you remembering the works of God this morning? Are you striving to walk in His will this morning? Go to Psalms 119, and let's look at a couple of verses there quickly. Psalms 119, verse 81. 
Psalms 119 and verse 81. Notice again what the Word of God says. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. And then if you go over just a few more verses to Psalms 119, verses 114 and 116, it says, Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Verse 116, Uphold me according to thy word that I may live, and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Now take your Bibles and go to Lamentations, to one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, Lamentations chapter 3, and let's look at verses 21 through 26. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. I think we can see a pattern that God's Word is telling us that if our hope is is in God, then we are going to continually be seeking His Word to understand what He longs to do for us. And notice in Lamentations 3, beginning in verse 21, Jeremiah says, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. And why does he have hope? Because verse 22, he said, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Do you believe that God's mercies are new every morning? That no matter how rough yesterday was, do you believe that God's mercies are new for you every morning? And it goes on in verse 24, and it says, The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. The only real hope that we have today is hope in God. Hope in his word and the promise of his soon coming. In fact, Hebrews 11 and verse 6 tells us that he that cometh to God must what? Believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This morning, where are you placing your hope? Where is your faith bound today? Is your trust totally in God? In order to believe in God's word and his soon coming and his power to save, I must first believe that he is God and that he can do what he says he can do in his word. But that can often be easier said than done. Why is that? Because life is hard. Now, you may have noticed this beautiful rose that I had this morning. And you're probably looking and going, where did he get that beautiful rose? A rose is a beautiful flower, isn't it? It's very special. And you know, when a man wants to tell a woman that he loves her, he'll buy her roses. There's a lot of beautiful flowers, but there's nothing quite like a beautiful red rose. But you know this morning that you and I have a lot in common with this flower. You see, God made every one of us special and unique and beautiful in our own way. But sometimes... Life has the ability to begin to start tearing at those beautiful petals. And life picks us away through the losses that we face, through the trials and the difficulties that we go through, through the rough spots and relationships that we have, the loss of a job, the loss of friendships, going through all of those things that we deal with, the cares of life, until finally life sometimes likes to just break us in half and throw us in the garbage. It's hard sometimes, isn't it, to feel special when you're broken. But you know, God didn't want it to be that way. God didn't want us to feel that we weren't special anymore. God doesn't like it when His children feel broken And inspiration tells us in a book that we studied just recently, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 117. It says, God in his great love is seeking to develop in us the precious graces of his spirit. He permits us to encounter obstacles, persecution, and hardships, not as a curse, but as the greatest blessing of our lives. 
Every temptation resisted, every trial bravely borne gives us a new experience and advances us in the work of character building. The soul that through divine power resists temptation reveals to the world and to heavenly universe the efficiency of the grace of Christ. Are you allowing the grace of Christ to move in your life? The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. How is your faith again this morning? We need to have that faith in Jesus. If Jesus is going to be able to work in us and accomplish what he longs to do. In Mount of Blessing, again, page 119, this should speak to your heart as it did to mine, to us. As to Peter, the word is spoken, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Thank God we are not left alone. Live in contact with the living Christ and he will hold you firmly by the hand and will never let go. Know and believe the love that God has to us and you are secure. Life is hard. But God is good. Remember that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In whom do you hope this morning? When life gets hard, in whom do you trust? When obstacles appear, to whom do you look? The story is told of a church that was received a piece of property from one of their members in a will. And they were going to build a new church and and they found the property and they used every inch of the property that they could except for the back section that had a huge mountain on the back. And they built the church in the parking lot and, and they were planning to have their dedication service only 10 days away. Well, the inspector came and he looked over the property and he looked at the size of the church and he told the pastor, he said, you know what? You're not going to be able to open this building until you make a parking lot big enough for the amount of people you can seat in this church. Well, that was a problem because they had used every inch of flat land that they could. The only thing left on their property was this mountain. But the pastor was a man of faith. And he called for a prayer meeting that Sunday night. And he said, I want all of you who have faith to move mountains, I want you to come and we're going to have a prayer meeting tonight. And so out of a 300-member church, only 24 people apparently had the faith to move mountains. They had a three-hour-long prayer meeting. And finally, when the last amen was said, the pastor smiled and he looked at all of the members and he said, we will have our dedication service next week. Everybody went home. The next morning, the pastor was working in his study, and there was a knock on the door. And he went to the door and opened up the side of the office door. And here was this big, burly construction man standing there. And he looked at him and said, Pastor, he said, I work for Acme Construction, and we're building a mall in the next county. But we need some dirt, and we need it now, because if we don't have a combated level place, we're not going to be able to continue. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to sell us that mountain behind your church. We'll even pave it for you for nothing. The next week, they had their dedication service, and they had their parking lot. When life is hard... In whom do you place your faith? I'd like for you to go back with me to the chapter of faith again, to Hebrews chapter 11. And let's look at just a couple of circumstances where God was truly testing the faith of his children. But he was also wanting them to be able to see the power of his redemption. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 29. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 29. I love to hear those pages turn. That sounds good. Hebrews 11 and verse 29, the Bible says, Through faith, excuse me, by faith, in verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians assigned to do were drowned. Now, you know the story very well. But you know what? Is this really a story of faith? Yes, they did walk through 
the Red Sea on dry ground. But before they went through that walk, they were complaining and murmuring to Moses. And they said, why did you take us out of Egypt? Why didn't you just let us stay there rather than bring us out here to die? Now, you got to admit, things didn't look too good, did they? The Red Sea in front of them, mountains on either side of them, and the Egyptian army coming after them. Now, the Israelites were not an army. And in fact, the interesting part is that's why God took them by way of the Red Sea. Had they gone by land and gone to the Philistines, they would have overcome them easily. They would have never got to the promised land. God knew what he was doing. And God brought them to a place where there was obviously and clearly no other way but for him. Now, I want you to hold your finger here in Hebrews and go back with me to Exodus. Exodus chapter 15. Actually, we're going to look at chapter 14 first. Exodus chapter 14. And I want you to notice how this scenario played out. I, I love, this is one of my favorite stories. I love the way this works. Go to Exodus chapter 14, and we're going to begin in verse 11. Exodus 14 and verse 11. The Bible says, And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Now listen carefully. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Wow. And then in verse 14, he says, The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Now, go over to verse 28. Verse 28, it says, And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Where is your faith this morning? When you hit those trials that you cannot see any way out, when you think that you are overcome by some problem in life, do you still trust that God has more answers than you could ever imagine or think? Now, I want you to notice what happened in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, before we move on. It says, then, then, after God went through all of that for them, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. I just want you to think for a minute, maybe it's just me, but... Should we not, if we have faith, be singing that song before the sea is parted? Is it really faith if I'm singing the song after it's all done and God's showed me what he will do? True faith says that when I can't see, when I don't know what's going to happen, I'm still going to trust. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans that I walk by faith, not by sight. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. We walk by faith and not by sight because sometimes what we see is not really what's going to happen. And sometimes we make mountains out of molehills. Where is your faith this morning? Look at now at Hebrews 11 and verse 30, one more. This one to me is actually even more incredible than the last one. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. The walls of Jericho fell down. Think about that. The children of Israel had no weapons of battle. They had, what do they call those big things that shot the big rocks in in those days? 
catapults. They didn't have any catapults. They didn't have anything to damage those walls. The Bible merely says the walls fell down. I want you to go with me now to this account. Go back with me to Exodus. No, no, sorry, not Exodus. To Joshua 6. Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Joshua chapter 6 and verses 1 through 5. This is an amazing story. Joshua 6, verses 1 through 5. Beginning verse 1, it says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thy hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horn. And on the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet... All the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend upon every man straight before him. Now, do you see that picture? Okay, now here we are today. You know, we are living in the time where we have wars and rumors of wars every day, don't we? And we're talking about nuclear weapons and we're talking about all these things. God's telling the children of Israel, I want you to march around this city. I want you to blow some trumpets and I want you to shout really loud. Now, does that seem like a good battle plan to you? You know, can you imagine what that million people walking around that city were saying to each other as they were, why are we doing this? What is God up to now? Why are we going around this city and just walking around it each day? And now the last day, God tells us we've got to do it seven times. I believe God wants us to be healthy, don't you? And God said, you know what? These are going to be a fit people. And we're going to walk around that city seven times. And then at the end of that seven times, we're going to blow the trumpets and we're going to shout and those walls are going to come down. And the people are walking around one Two, and they're going, this is ridiculous. God really thinks that this is going to happen? Where is your faith when things look like they're totally out of your control? Are you willing to follow God when he gives you an instruction to do something that seems totally contrary to everything you think is right? The walls of the city did, in fact, crumble and fall flat. What kind of walls are before you today? What kind of mountains stand in your way? Do you really have enough faith to trust that God is there? Faith is trusting through the trials. In the middle of the struggle, we don't see how our children who have left the faith will ever return, but God does. We don't see how our marriage could ever be strong again, but God does. We don't see how we will ever get work again, but God does. We don't know how we will ever gain victory over that besetting sin, but God does. And his promise is that he will be with us. Our text for today is found in Isaiah. Please go there. Isaiah 43, Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. Faith is trusting through the trial and always looking to God no matter what may happen. Isaiah 43, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Are you God's children this morning? In verse 2 now, he says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. 
When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Now, you know, whenever I read that, I can't help but think about those three Hebrew worthies. And, you know, sometimes we go through fiery trials in our lives. We go through struggles and times when we seem to feel lost and we don't know what direction to go. We don't know where we are. But God wants us to know this morning that he will always be there beside us. There was a story of a man who was lost in the desert. And he was wandering around for days and he knew he needed water. And he saw this small little shack off in the distance and he made his way over to this shack. And as he came up to the shack, he noticed that there was an old wellhead with a pump. And on top of the wellhead, there was a bucket of water. And a note that said, if you need water, pour the water into the pump to prime it and you'll get all the water you need. Now, he had been without water for a day or two. He knew that he had an option. He could either trust what that note said and pour it in the pump and hope that the pump worked, or he could drink the water that was in the bucket and hope that it would be enough. But he didn't know where he was, and he said, that may not work. And so he decided that he would go ahead and he would pour the water into the pump. He poured the water into the pump and he began pumping that handle and nothing was happening. His faith began to falter. He began to worry just a little bit. But then all of a sudden, he heard that little, you know, that little gurgling noise you hear. And he started to pump and all of a sudden the water was flowing out of that pump so fast that he began pumping and he was finding every container he could find in that little in that little shack and he was filling them up with water and he pumped all the water he could find and he took a shower and he rinsed himself off and he drank and then as he began to leave he thought to himself I need to add one thing to that note I'm going to put that bucket of water back on the top of that pump but at the end of that note when it tells you the instructions of what to do I'm going to say please prime the pump it works You see, if you have had God work in your life, if you have had God's power move in your circumstances and you have seen him work mightily in your behalf, are you telling others about the power of God? Do you share with other people what he has done for you and that he can do the same thing for them? You know, sometimes we look at trials. How many of you like to go through trials? I'm glad nobody raised their hand. Sometimes you have a brave soul that raises your hand. I, trials are of the Lord, and I, I, I like trials. You know, I'm glad you, you're honest with me today. I don't like going through trials, but I will tell you this this morning, that I believe that God uses trials because he wants us to be ready. And, you know, I want to share with you just one more story. There was a woman's study group that was going through their Bibles together. And, and one morning as they were going through their study, they were in the book of Malachi chapter 3. And they came to the statement in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 3. It said that he sits as a refiner of silver. Now, they were all wondering, what does that mean? And, and, and what is God really trying to reveal to us about his character in that statement? And so one lady volunteered. She said, you know what? This week, I'm going to go down and try to find a silversmith. And I'm going to ask him if I can watch him as he processes silver. And so she went down and she made an appointment. And she sat down. And the first thing that she noticed was the silversmith had this very, very hot flame. And he, and he took the little, the little container of silver and he sat it over the very center of that flame. And he told her, he said, you know, in order to process the silver, to purify it, he said, you have to put it in the hottest part of the flame so that the dross is burnt away. She began to think about that and how God works with us. She thought, but surely God wouldn't put us into the hottest part of the flame and just leave us there. And she noticed that he sat there through that whole process holding that silver. And she said, now, can you leave the silver and come back? And he said, oh, no. He said, you have to watch it very closely. 
He said, because if you don't watch it very closely, he said, when the dross comes off, he said, you can ruin the silver. And she said, wow, that's incredible. So God allows us to go through these trials, but he's always right there beside us, never to allow us to go through more than we can handle. And then she asked him, she said, well, how do you know when the silver is ready? How do you know when it's, when it's ready to take it out? He said, oh, that's the easiest part of all. He said, it's when I can see my reflection in the silver. You see, when we go through those trials and those struggles of life, God allows us to do that so that we can look like him. Life is hard, but God is good. When dark days come and they come to us all, we feel so helpless and lost and small. We cannot fathom the reason reason why, and it is futile for us to try. To find the answer, the reason, or cause, for the master plan is without any flaws. And when darkness shuts out the light, we must lean on faith to restore our sight. For there is nothing we need to know if we have faith that wherever we go, God will be there to help us bear our disappointments, pain, and care. For he is our shepherd, our father, our guide, and you're never alone with the Lord at your side. So may the great physician attend you, and may his healing completely mend you. There's four quick things I want you to remember when life is hard. Number one, remember that your character should always be stronger than your circumstances. Your character should always be stronger than your circumstances. Pray when you feel like worrying. Give thanks when you feel like complaining. Keep going when you feel like quitting. Number two, remember your struggles always lead to strength. This is an important one. Your struggles always lead to strength. And I like what has been said. Your greatest struggles will someday be your greatest stories. Your greatest struggles will someday be your greatest stories. And number three, remember God's timing is always perfect. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, God says, thoughts of good and not of evil, to bring you an expected end. God's timing may not be your timing, it may not be mine, but God's timing is perfect. And God is always working according to his time. And finally, number four, remember God will never leave your side. Life may cruelly try to pluck out the petals and break us into two. But do you know that God can take that pain and he can use all of those circumstances and those situations. He can take that pain and that trial and that sorrow and he can begin remaking us again, beginning to get us to shine and to reflect that image one more time. And and you know, before long, we can look like that beautiful rose again. I'm thankful for a God like that this morning, aren't you? Trials come. God allows the trials to come to refine us so that we can reflect him to those around us. Let's pray together as we close. Our loving Father in heaven, Lord, help us this morning to be able to sense that special uniqueness that you've given each one of us. I pray this morning, Lord, that we will not have allowed the the trials, the struggles, the difficulties, the disappointments of life to break us to the point that we don't sense the specialness that you've given each one of us. Encourage our hearts today to know that you've promised you will never leave us or forsake us. And that means even during those trials that you are right there beside us. Just like those three Hebrew worthies, Lord, may we know that even in the fires of life, you are standing right next to us. May our faith grow. May it strengthen day by day. And may we finally, as we go through that refining process, reflect your image fully so that others may know what you are truly like, a God of love and mercy. Bless us to this end, we pray. Keep us in your care. And may we enjoy the rest of our Sabbath day and our fellowship together this afternoon. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.